Okay, are you able to see the uh, slide now? Yes. Yes. Great, okay, let me go ahead and start. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the last chapter. Yeah. Jack, because before you start, please mute everybody. Okay. Huh? Because I will be uh, presenting, so it's going to be hard to, to try to control this uh, while presenting. Uh, when I'm in full screen, I, I don't get to see the discipline, stuff like that. Priyat, you could unmute everyone and let them mute themselves, and then if anyone wanted to speak, they would be able to. I think they, they have control. Um, they have control to mute themselves. It just, uh, I'm trying to, I don't get to see the control here. Uh. Okay. Oh. Why, why is recording? I, I, I don't have control of it. But this Alina, is... Alina, you need to mute your phone. Okay. Uh... Okay, let me go ahead and get started. Um, first off, um, this is the picture that we have from uh, last year Texas Federation Convention. So for those of you that uh, are not aware of it yet, um, our uh, 85th Texas Federation uh, Convention this year has been postponed. So uh, just a reminder. But let me go ahead and start with a question. Who do you look for first? speaker okay who else what was Myself. the question what was the question uh, who do you look for first when you look at the picture of course yourself and why actually I should ask why Human nature. Yeah. Most of, most of us, most, most of the time, what we do is we look for ourselves in the picture. Because that's, that's the way that we gravitate. We always gravitate to ourselves. Um, self centeredness is the focus that we have is always to ourselves. So in a in a group picture similar to this one, most people will usually try to look for where they are in the picture, first of all. And that should not be surprising to anyone. So that this uh, concept that is mentioned in the last chapter, it, it say that I'm aware of what I call my thoughts desire, feeling, sensation, etc., taking place within myself, within a limited psychological space that belong to me, but I cannot perceive directly what happened to you because your emotion and thought are outside of my personal space. You see, in the objective reality, uh, at the uh, highest level, the ultimate reality, there's only one truth, right? A tree is a tree is tree like this. But each one of us would subjectively in our own space think of the tree in a different manner. Right? Like this 
guy I hear, look at the tree and he just see it as a tree, nothing else. This lady right here, look at the tree and think of the apple that get produced from it. And then this lady right here, think beyond that, you know, oh, I can make some money off of that apple. Anyway, reality is one thing. And then in terms of the subjective psych psychological space that we're deal dealing with, with our personal consciousness, it's a different thing. So as a review, at the beginning of the chapter, uh, Pablo mentioned, you know, the Atman, which is a spirit in the individual, is not something that each person possess. It's a space that each individual will occupy within this ocean of indivisible universal spirit. So it's clear that this space is not the three-dimensional physical expanse in which the objects are found. Rather, it alludes to the kind of metaphysical or spiritual aspect that we call space. So we can see here in the diagram that Atman represents our true nature at the highest level. And it's a source of our consciousness. But on a daily basis, we don't operate at that level. On a daily basis, we are down here. Most of the time, we operate in the, our physical body and using our five senses, we just aware of what is visible to us. Like Fali used to say, you know, we use our senses, which is only, if you look at this particular diagram, the seven principles that theosophy has shed light to us, the body is only at most 15% of the entire human constitution. Yet, we live in that 15% without realizing that the rest of the remaining of our constitution is not readily visible to us. So in the, in the chapter it mentioned, when consciousness expresses itself through the different vehicle, all the vehicle of consciousness going from your um, psychological uh, low ego all the way to the high ego and then the monad itself, whenever that consciousness is trying to express itself in each individual vehicle, it identifies exactly with, with wherever that vehicle happened to be. The problem is we've been after many reincarnation, we are stuck with our physical body so much that we get the, the limit or the boundary put on us that we think that our physical body is the only mean of consciousness that we are aware of. Um, this slide is just a reminder that absolute consciousness at the Atman level, the, or the ultimate reality is neither that, it's neither this or that, nor that. So as you go higher and higher, you will find that there always are this paradox. Um, it's everything yet it's nothing. That paradox will will be um, something that, that, that you will see more and more. Everything, so at the universal conscious le conscious level, everything is immutable because it, it, it has, it does not change. I mean, at the spirit level, everything is immutable. It's eternal and unlimited. So, if we talk about absolute 
reality of, of the, this unity of oneness versus the subjective psychological space of our personal consciousness, we can see that here in, in the diagram, the unity of the elephant, that's oneness of this truth, even though at our individual level, each person in our own subjective mind, using our own level of personal consciousness awareness, we can only see a piece of the entire unity or the oneness. So space itself has no real boundary. Is we ourselves put the boundary in place over our lifetime. We create the limit of our own psych psychological space by identifying with our personality. So consciousness itself is not limited by the space or the form itself. It's able to be aware of whatever it takes on in terms of the one life, the expression that happened. So the last chapter, the main focus of this last chapter is how do we avoid the focalization of the cell centralization of the consciousness? Because it really limits the capacity for us to perceive life from a wider perspective. Um, the first page in the chapter has this statement right here. The principal obstacle to the realization of oneness is the inborn habit of man of always placing himself at the center of the universe. Whatever a man might act, think or feel, the irrepressible I is sure to be the central figure. So, the I-ness, this is just a review from chapter four. The origin of this sense of I-ness come from the manas, which is the mind. It's the mental faculty which make us the intelligent and moral being and distinguish him from the mere animal. Um, he also mentioned manas, Manas definition, straight definitions in mind or to think. And Manu is the man of the thinker. So this principle, Manas, is what help us to evolve. Um, because the Atman and the Bodhi are just principle. They are the spirit and it has no way of reaching down to uh, our level. So the manas is essentially the bridge between the spirit and the material where we are living right now. So it also mentioned manas is at once a principle and an entity. Our ego, uh, our individuality that we um, possess is what help us to do reincarnate between the, our different body. So the individuality lasts beyond the lifetime, uh, beyond each life span, and it is a bridge. So each time that we reincarnate into a different personality, we take on a new cell body and so over the course of time this manas retrieve or obtain all the awareness of each individual I-ness, each individual personality and that's how it learn and grow. So um, the focus is we are at the personal ego or the low ego right here. I am John Smith. The focus is to break through that barrier to 
identify ourselves with the high ego because the high ego survived the different reincarnation and eventually we have to break out that barrier and go up to a higher level i am the whole because at that spiritual universal soul it is essentially the one so this is just a review expansion of consciousness so how do we expand our consciousness from the diagram right here this is in the previous chapter we have the individual vehicle when we came down to this earth we have all the individual vehicle already in place but those individual vehicle come down in an unconscious manner okay as we get separated now at the human level we are trying to go in the up upward direction right now so as human we are at the conscious functional ego i am mr smith right here so the goal for us is to break through this barrier. Each one of these barriers is one separation from one realm to the next. We are supposed to break through this barrier to rediscover our ultimate truth of the, our, our one self. So to realize that unity, the first step is to seize identification with our personality as uh, Tim Boy I remember Tim Boy used to say uh, at our um, meeting uh, West in, in West Study Center of Houston it's the misidentification that we have when we are born uh, somebody calls us by our name and then we get so used to it and we misidentify we thought that we are what our name is we are our physical body so we need to avoid that identification with the personality and start uniting our consciousness with the high ego which is our so the source of our sense of being since our consciousness is not habituated to proceed beyond the personal center our practice must involve an attempt to decentralize it Okay, so in this chapter, uh, Pablo present to us the different method to decentralize our consciousness and expand it. And um, he briefly covered Pawlowski diagram of meditation. Uh, he didn't go into a lot of detail, but he did um, briefly brought like a broad stroke, go through it a little bit. Um, it takes, I believe, a thousand of hours to go through the entire material and, and talk about it. So um, the book is the last chapter, it just briefly uh, go through it. So the main goal of the diagram of meditation is the design to help us break the, that identification with our lower consciousness because as long as we identify with the body we always feel that we are right here and nowhere else as long as we identify ourselves with the mind we will always think that we exist right now or we were born in the past and we will die in the future the main diagram of the meditation actually talk about uh, a set of things that you can do called acquisitions that you can cultivate the positive and then the thing that uh, called deprivation which uh, identify the, the stuff that you can eliminate so eliminate the negative the transitory and the unreal 
Uh, Pablo didn't go into that deep level of detail in, in the, the chapter. Uh, he just, like I say, um, mentioned some of the more of the technique or the meditation that you could go through. So the exercise that he mentioned to help realize the boundless and timeless nature of the uh, monadic consciousness is the three exercises that, that, that were mentioned in, in the chapter. Uh, first one is essentially a meditation on unity, which uh, we expand our awareness beyond the limitation of space and time that belong to the personal ego. And then once we have accomplished that first exercise, the next step is to drop the consciousness, uh, conscious effort and stay in the state of silent awareness, absorbing and merging with that state produced. And this eventually opened the door to a perception that beyond the realm of words, image and thought. And then the last exercise is the daily attitude in which your imagination is used to cultivate that feeling that we as pure consciousness in all space and time. So um, when I was reading through the chapter, I, um, there were lots of words um, and, and I, he explained the exercise and what you go through, but I, I think for the purpose of um, our talk, I think it's easier because we, we grasp the video and the audio much more rarely than the, the word itself. So um, Timothy had uh, sent us this uh, video a while ago, and I think this would be a, a good illustration um, to expand, uh, to, to talk about expansion in space and time without cell identification. Did, did someone just text me? Um, chat Let's see how you bring up the chat in there. okay That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged 
by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So that's the pale blue plot, blue, blue dot. Um, the other exercise that um, Pablo go through is um, the expansion based on cell identification. So let me go ahead. So when you do the exercise of uh, expansion in space with shell identification, you're supposed to think of more like a bubble um, where you would imagine this bubble expanding from where you are out, getting bigger and bigger. So this video, uh, this is just a, a, a short, really fast video. Uh, this one you can find on the Google as well. It, it's called a zooming out from a tiny late uh, ladybug to a rotating earth. So imagine yourself like a bubble. Um, think of the uh, tree and uh, neighborhood around yourself. And then think of your uh, uh, block, uh, street, community, uh, the surrounding area with all the folks and the, the people, the animals, the trees. And then zooming out a bit more to perhaps your um, city where you're living. And then eventually to the state where you're living. And then the country where you're living. Ah, it's really hard to do this thing. PowerPoint is fighting with me. And then 
the continent where you're living, the earth, your solar system. Uh, it's probably easier if I just play the whole thing. And then the galaxy and then the universe. Okay, the other exercise is the expansion of in time with cell identification. So he give a, a, just a brief overview of, of what, what you should imagine. Uh, start going back 10 to 20 years, visualize all the detail, and then how, how do you feel about it? Uh, despite all the change in your body, emotion, thought, circumstances, you still feel the same eyes, right? Uh, spend enough time each step to see how things changes and then get this feeling of the silent present, right? The immutable yourself, that awareness, that, that overshadow, that personality that has grown and changed over the years. But over those years, you know, going back even further to a different lifetime, a different reincarnation. Perhaps you were with a different race, you were with a different sex and culture, and then until there's no human being, right? Experience that that perhaps that animal form that you was to be, you, you were, and then the tree and mineral going back all the way to when the earth well, just cosmic dust, and then the solar system, the galaxy, and so on. See the Big Bang, right? The the moment that the universe will form. So that's basically going back in time, and now taking the same exercise going forward in time. Imagine yourself in the next lifetime, maybe in a different race, a different root race, at a much more evolved level and a much higher level of awareness, and then becoming the aligned being and eventually becoming part of the logo, going back to part, become part of the logos and starting the cycle again with a different generation, a, a new set of generations, right? So that's the exercise that, that is in, um, in time using the cell identification. And then the very last exercise, actually, yeah, this last exercise, it's not the very last, it's the second exercise is to go beyond the word and imagination. So he gave a, a one example in the chapter, which is when you're going for a walk, try to feel that you embrace everything around, your body being just one object within your field. This will eventually open the door for a perception that's beyond the realm of words images and thought. And for those of you who are wondering where this picture is, is uh, the Bouchard Garden in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. So we use the exercise previously, expansion in space and time is to make use of, of our mental faculty, um, the mind. So with the mind, you can use images, you can use sound, you can use uh, thoughts and feelings uh, with, with the mind. But 
to go beyond the mind. There is no, um, we don't have any um, we, we don't have any um, words or uh, description that can actually put justice to that level of self-awareness because at the going beyond the, the mind at the booty level um, there just no description that that can fully describe that that feeling or that knowledge right so that that's what this second exercise is about so the last exercise that he go into it's called the payasa awareness meditation and this this method is connected to the quality of awareness. Uh, we seek neither to focus our attention nor to induce any given state. Instead, we simply pay attention to whatever is actually happening in our ordinary consciousness at the moment without judgment or manipulation. We are like the immutable space that contains the psychological movement but not, but is not affected by his activity. So during this uh, meditation, it should free from it should be free from fear and judgment. Uh, relax all effort inward and outward. Uh, watch everything with a pure, non-reactive and uninvolved awareness, with a sense of love, acceptance and integration, even toward the so-called negative state. Emotion and thought um, are essentially manifestation of elemental energy. They are natural part of our cosmos. They are neither good nor bad in themselves. They become positive or negative only when we identify with them. Thus, letting them take root in our consciousness and influence our action. So he offered the exercise of a seating uh, meditation, which is you sit down quietly, close your eyes, relax, turn your attention inward, and then watch wherever enter. Uh, do not seek to manipulate. Just let the sensation, emotion, and thought rise and fall by themselves. Observe their emotion with a silent and uninvolved awareness. Shift from normal identification to a pure witnessing of them. So that's the sitting meditation that you can do on a daily basis. But in terms of the daily life, he offered this this is to go beyond the sitting meditation because the way it works is you can only sit maybe uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day if you have the time to do so. And the problem with that is most of the time in your daily life, there's lots of stuff coming up. So it's very difficult to find the time to uh, to, to expand your awareness, right? So he encouraged us to expand our level of awareness in our daily life by applying it to everything that we do in life. So you start out, uh, this is the different level of awareness. At the beginning, perhaps you start out with just focusing on the external aspect of it just do the action itself. When you're doing your action, just be fully aware of doing, for example, the example here is doing dishes that he offered in the chapter. When you're doing your dishes, aware of the act that you're doing the dishes, doing them mindfully and with grace. Moving slowly with grace, paying attention to the dishes, you grab them, wash them, put them to dry, 
you know, do not let any of the movement be mechanical, but perform every action purposefully. That means placing your focus into what you do, making sure that you do it correctly, don't break any dishes, and so on. And then once you have mastered that level of awareness, take it to the next step, the next higher level, which is consider not only the action, they also consider the actor, both externally and internally. Shift your awareness back, say, for the beginning of the motion of your hand. Encourage the feeling that you have for your body when it moves. As if you are looking at someone else's movement. Think of you as watching a, a video, a how-to video, for example, and looking at from a third person perspective, looking at the video, observing what that person is doing with their movement. Be, awareness, uh, be aware of the physical sensation of thing going through your hands, right? The water, the way the dishes, et cetera. How the soap is lavishing your hand and, and so on. And then once you master that level of awareness, take it on to the next level, which is the thinker. This is your mind, right? Pay attention to your mind. What are the thoughts and the emotion actually are going through your mind at that point in time? You know, is the water too hot? Is the water too cold? Do not try to correct them, the thought and feeling, emotion, but do not engage with anything that may appear in your mind. Just watch the thoughts and the emotion as if they are somebody else. Okay? Because all of that is, be, will become memory. It's just a memory in your mind. And then the very last level of awareness exercise is to the pure being, which is the internal and beyond. And this is where you do your dishes pay attention to the sense of being there, being in the moment, be aware of all the level of consciousness that are happening spontaneously. Your body is moving and your thoughts running into your mind. Be aware of being aware. And that's what this last level is all about. You don't try to focus on them. You just simply be, just let it be. So as you go through that exercise and you master it, at some point, you will reach this hygienic state. This is to become the immutable sphere of awareness in which the sensation, the emotion, the thought spontaneously appear and disappear without really affecting our true nature. An example that they give in the book was think of the immutable sky that cannot be tainted by the passing cloud. So the example, most example, the other example he has is a mirror which can reflect the beautiful, all the ugly things without mm -hmm. being embellished or tainted by the passing reflection. So most of this is describing space and time. If you think of space, Space is the background to which the object can present themselves. Space is everywhere, right? So for us to put our, our concrete mind to visualize something, we have to have a background. Space is essentially the background that show us between two points, point A and point B, object A, an object B. Our concrete mind like to reason, like to measure stuff. So space provide a mechanism for us to measure that, the relativity between two objects. So space is essentially the background. Time is the background for the event. So the way we think of it, time is actually for us, we think time is something that's real. 
But in reality, time is just an illusion when you really think about it. Time is the background of the event. So when we look at it, there are two events that happen. A before event, the chicken or the egg, right? Those events are essentially in some sequence. Time is what provides the sequence to us so that our concrete mind can understand that. So fate and time are the, essentially the background for us to understand and correlate and relate, okay? So this practice, along with the general effort at leading a spiritual life, we eventually make the temporary state of manastayasa more and more available until it becomes permanent in the union of the Bodhi manas. So that should reach the, the end of the, 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 the chapter. Um, there's a few slides that I have here that, um, that have nothing to do with the chapter. So, but I'm going to briefly go through them. Um, and then the very last slide is about uh, COVID-19. Um, so, when, when we go to school, our school measure us in terms of aptitude, okay? Uh, they give it to us aptitude test. Aptitude is essentially talking about your ability to do something according to the dictionary here. So talent, aptitude, and stuff like that is what school, uh, the school system that we grow up with teach us to do. But in terms of life, life measure us by, not by attitude, not, not by aptitude, but by attitude. Because our attitude determines how we think and feel about something and how we, we will uh, act, right? As I say here, uh, you can see in this screenshot, attitude is everything. So what's in your box? Each one of these box is essentially our mind. How high can we fly with it? Depend on what we put into the box. The aptitude, the attitude, and so on. So attitude determines the altitude. You can soar when you have a feeling, when your attitude is being elevated, both inside and outside. So the recipe for adding lift to your flight is it at a bit of enthusiasm and assignment to your day. Add a bit of inspiration, motivation, and a pinch of creat creativity. All of those are components that are described at the higher level, the aspiration, right? Because at the higher level, that's where we want to reach. So you want to really free your mind, you need to really, like the saying go, think outside of the box. And, and that's what um, this, this last slide I have, um, it was sent out uh, by uh, this uh, Dr. Monica Lanky. It had been spreading around um, in the Twitter, a lot of places, but I believe this uh, doctor is the source of it. So, this question, how do I want to be during COVID-19? So during this challenging time, it's natural to react in a way to ensure our safety and the safety of those we care about. It's important to tend to our most in immediate need and address our most immediate challenges. Challenging, however, also presents us with the opportunity to grow support order and become valuable in our in new and different way. Sometimes if a mindset is right, 
we can also learn a great deal about ourselves, who we are, who we can become. Perhaps you may find this graphic to be helpful in thinking through who you want to be during this difficult time for all of us. So um, it show here the mindset that uh, you see across the board uh, between different people. So which mindset zone do you want to operate in? The outermost layer or the innermost one? And I, I think it blends well with this last chapter. It's about um, taking it beyond what you normally do. Try to step out of your comfort zone and hopefully make life better for everyone. And that should be the end of my uh, presentation. We can start question and answer if needed. Um, let me go ahead and unshare. That way um, we can see everyone. <clears throat> How do I unshare that? <laughs> Stop share. Okay. Jeff is a very good uh, presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, Treat, I want to thank you also for that. That was a great presentation. I'd like to make a comment on. Um, I'm not going to make all the comments. I'm a comment person, but uh, on the one where you showed the gardens and we're talking about, um, you know, moving into a bigger awareness than just the local minefield. Another way, a, a, a way to incorporate that is to move the focus of the eyes from what is like a focus, laser focus. We tend to use a pinpoint focus, but when we soften our eyes so that we're not looking directly at anything with a focus, we tend to then take in the peripheral world and we tend to be laser focused. That's why there's so much eye strain. But when we soften our eyes and use our peripheral vision, I've done that when I was walking before and just have brought in so much more into my awareness than when I'm just looking straight where I'm walking and where I'm going to step. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing experience just to widen the perspective, just that one little, um, activity or action. Thank you. Yes, um, there's a way of looking at uh, that I didn't mention in the slide, which is uh, a third person perspective. That literally mean uh, think of uh, a camera crew that follow you around. So in a third person perspective, when you walk through uh, a scene like that, don't look with just your eye. Uh, use the awareness of that someone, the camera crew is following you. You know, it, it, it basically capturing the scene. Get that feeling. That's what you're trying to aim for because um, you're no longer looking at from a first person perspective. Now you're looking at a third person perspective and they give a, a, a much better, uh, broader viewpoint and, and imagine that throughout your life as well, every action, everything you do, every emotion, every feeling that you have, look at it more from a third person's perspective. Imagine there's someone that's following you around, capturing everything that you do, writing down everything that you do, every thought that you have, that's the way you wanna operate in. Anyone else? I see Folly. Hi, Folly. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Folly. So, uh, try it. I think one of the exercises that the author uh, introduced was. Um, looking at your life 
in this incarnation and going back several times to see your life in past incarnations and also going forward to see your life in future incarnation. And not only that, but also as uh, he mentioned from Light on the Path, he says, live neither in the present nor the future, but the eternal now. So that's also one good exercise to realize our eternal being. Yes. Um, because if you really think about it, the, the divine spark, each one of us is the divine spark. Our job and our goal is to learn to experience these things, to experience everything, actually. So the eternal is, to become the eternal, you have to learn and experience all of that. So not, not the momentarily right here, right now, right? All the event that happening is just an illusion. It's a, a mechanism for us to learn. So whatever shape or form that we are taking on right now, eventually we will have every single shape and form because we need to learn all that knowledge to become the eternal. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? So, well, I, I have another comment. Yeah. And, and that was, um, there was a slide or a place where you're saying the, the thing that keeps us from being who we are, from really realizing who we are, is that we identify with I and not the oneness. I think that's what you said, is that correct? Yes. And uh, when we move from the non-dual perspective, I mean, when we move from the dualistic perspective to the non-dual, um, they, they add to that because they, they see enlightenment as the same as oneness. And waking up is the same as enlightenment and is the same as oneness. And it said that one of the reasons that we don't expand is that we actually don't believe that we can. And that belief alone is enough to keep it from happening. We think it can happen to masters. We think it can happen for everyone else, but we don't believe that it can happen for us. And then if we do believe it can happen for us, we believe that it can only happen in the future, that if we study and we work and we study and we work, that sometimes in the future that will happen. But the problem is in the eternal now, the eternal now can never be accessed in the future. It can only be accessed in the present, in the eternal now, not in the time now and, and not anything in space and time, but in the eternal now. So I just wanted to add those two aspects uh, you know, past the ego, personal identification, the, past the story of me, is what it's now called in contemporary uh, spiritual language, the story of me. When we move past the story of me for, to identification, then we move into what beliefs actually hold us from getting there. So there's identification, and then after the identification, there are beliefs. Yeah, um, that's the boundary that we set up as we grow older, right? Um, so as a kid, by my kid, they want to be a doctor, they want to be a lawyer, they want to be everything. They want to, like my oldest, he want to be a astronaut, <laughs> right? So as you grow, um, the more you face life, the more boundary you start putting in place. And, and that's the problem because it, it, it's a mental block. Uh, for every single one of us, uh, when in reality, um, we can accomplish anything that we set our mind to, and um, I, I guess. <laughs> well, the difference between that and um, what we were speaking of in terms of what holds us back is 
we're talking about, you're talking about what holds us back in the physical, like how much we can accomplish in the world. And this, we then we, we move, it's like moving kind of like a spiritual materialism, moving from um, using that same process at a higher level. You see what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it, it's not just what can I do in this world? It's like, now I'm a spiritual being. Now I've got these accomplishments as a spiritual being. What am I going to do as a spiritual being? I'm going to meditate. How can I get to enlightenment? So we move to the higher questions, the more existential questions of life from just the ordinary maintenance. Like, what am I going to do with this body in this space and time? It's like, you know, I want to expand, but it's the same kind of barrier that's holding back that you mentioned, only it's at a higher spiritual, spiritual or consciousness level. Yeah. The, um, that's why I, I like about that, that uh, the last input that I have for the chapter, right? The, the, the box itself. Um, it's the box that we put in place for ourselves that, that limit us. Uh, essentially, um, from a spiritual level, there's no box, there's no boundary that's physically there. Um, yeah, the problem is when when you haven't reached that level, that level of understanding, a level of, of learning of something that is not familiar to you, it's very hard to conceptualize uh, what it is. Um, there's a saying that my, my dad used to, uh, a fable that my dad used to explain to us or actually talk about is the, the fish and the frog. Uh, the fish say that the frog, the, the frog say, uh, you know, to the fish that, you know, there's a, this place where you live completely dry. There's no water at all. And then the fish doesn't understand what that is. So un until you step outside of the realm that you are uh, in and, and actually experience that, that level of awareness, yeah, you, you're not going to be able to grasp and understand what it is. I have to make a comment on that too. Sorry, everybody, y'all can mm -hmm. shut me up if you want to, but there are two levels of limits. One is that we are born into an already limiting system. For example, just our language in itself is a limited system defined by what tenses we had. So we're born in, it's not like we chose to be born into that at a conscious level. Maybe we chose our incarnation, but we're born into an existence. Um, as it, for example, there's some stone age tribes that do not have a language for the future and the past. Therefore, it's not very difficult for them to live into the present because their conversation is in the present. So we're born into these limiting systems. And then we personally developed our own story. In the story of me, we personally develop our, limit, our own limiting systems. So a lot of times we can move our limiting systems from our personal eye, but then we also have to move through what the race consciousness systems as well. So there are two levels of moving through that system, the systems to, to reach that the source or to unlimit or to get out of the box. Yeah. Um, well, if no one has questions, uh, I'd like to throw out uh, one final question, which is mentioned uh, is, so how do we apply in our daily life? How do we avoid focalizing on the thing that we do in terms of space and time, if all we can think about is now and here and right now, where we are at. Is there any exercise that you do on a daily basis that help to uh, decentralize your, your focus beyond what Anne has already mentioned? Bali, uh, you have any input?
Pranam. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Well, yeah. No, I, I didn't have a comment, but uh, I guess um, every day is different. So you you got to kind of meditate um, for each day. Um, start your day off positive. And, and I, I like what you had at the end of the presentation, uh, where you want your, I think it's what part of that graph you want to be in. Yes. Yeah, uh, and you you pick the the outer one, seem to be more positive. Um, yeah, it's, I was thinking about that because like if you get your facts straight, whatever facts you can gather, you tend to have a different perspective on things. And I guess I'm just trying to comment on. Sometimes there's a lot of things in out there and in, in the news that are contradictory. And you just, I just try to be careful of my first reaction to something, just step back away from it and try not to be impacted negatively by it and just uh, try, to, try to understand that it may not be reality sometimes, only in your mind whatever your mind will come up with sometime it can might not be the right right thing to focus on so that's why i mentioned meditating and and just try to put things in perspective in a positive way thank you thanks ronald um yes that's the that's the important uh focus it's it, like like I mentioned in the uh, presentation, uh, we tend to have a tendency to focus on the external. Uh, that external environment consists only 15% of our human constitution, yet we place more focus on that 15% than the rest of the other. Um, so in meditation, what we're trying to do is go to the to go inward and not so much outward. Um, that remaining 85% is what we're trying to aim for. We need to understand what that emotion means to us, what that mind is doing, and what the thought means to us. Are we related to that? And are we truly what that is? So, uh, the focus of meditation is to focus going inward and, and not so much uh, going outward. Because in the ultimate reality, uh, those external, at the spiritual level, though external um, doesn't, it's not lasting, right? It's not eternal. It's, it's only the spiritual that is eternal. I have a question based on what you just said will you go more in can you hear me yes okay will you go more into when you say 15 percent is is that just the body what is that 15 percent made out of uh the 50 percent is the physical body uh let me go ahead and go back to the slide It's this guy right here. Now, uh, 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 
uh, this guy. Yeah, you're right. It's essentially your physical body. It's, it's just five senses. Does it make sense? If you take one out of seven, it's essentially 15%. But um, try. It. Yes. Yeah, there's also a saying that um, there's also a saying that of our brain power, and that uh, and that with meditation and so on, we can increase the uh, the percentage of our brain power that we can we can use. So maybe that also links to your fifteen percent. Yes, it's to make sure uh, to utilize all of the level of awareness, right? That that last um, exercise that he mentioned in that thing, which is to grow in terms of your level of awareness from just the external environment to the internal environment and then beyond that. Okay. Um, anyone else? Any, any other feedback, uh, input, or questions? Seems like y'all are more silent online than <laughs> in person. <laughs> because whenever we have these uh, meeting in person, there's a lot of questions. Uh, I think you articulated that presentation really well. Okay. Okay, so um, is there any other uh, topic that anyone want to talk about in general? It doesn't have to be about the presentation. I think that diagram, uh, the COVID-19 diagram, which you showed is uh, very interesting. And if you can share that, uh, at least with me, I don't know whether others might be interested in that. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Um, I will um, capture this video and uh, have Lynn upload it online along with the presentation. Okay, thanks. I think it would be interesting for people just to comment on how their lives maybe have been impacted by the vi the COVID virus or the stay home or just how they're coping or what they're doing, just kind of a check-in state of being kind of thing. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording for now and then we can just talk informally. <laughs>